Hello everyone! We all love random numbers, but the problem with them is that they're a little too random. White noise is all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason to the RNG. It looks very unnatural. This would make white noise a very poor source of RNG for something we want to look organic such as terrain. Mountains in the real world do not look like white noise. The features are all relatively self-similar and spatially consistent. It follows a trend. This is a problem that Ken Perlin sought to solve 40 years ago when he invented the very famous Perlin noise. While still random, Perlin noise produces a much smoother and organic looking signal than raw white noise that is more than capable of producing convincing, natural looking structures to model stuff like mountains, sand dunes, clouds, or whatever else. So how does Perlin noise work? How do we go from white noise to this? What improvements did Ken Perlin make to the algorithm over the years? All this and more in today's video where we learn about one of the most important graphics algorithms in history. So, how do computers actually generate random numbers? Well, they don't. Anytime we are talking about random numbers, we're really talking about pseudo-random numbers. The results, while seemingly random, are still deterministic and predictable. Pseudo-random number generators come in many, many forms. A common one is known as a linear congruential generator, which takes in an initial seed, and then anytime we want a random number, we shuffle that seed around with a bunch of math operations to make it seem like a new random number. Advanced random number generators often depend on maintaining a state, but on the GPU, where we will be doing our work today, we don't have the privilege of state, and so when we want random numbers on the GPU, we make use of hashing functions. Hash functions take in a value and shuffle it around a bunch with bit operations and other math operations to create a seemingly random value from the input. Hash functions are pseudo-random because the same inputs will always have the same outputs. The quality of a hash function is measured by the lack of a perceivable pattern in the RNG and inputs close in value should have wildly different outputs. For instance, if we hash 1, its result should be very different from hashing 2 or 3, and so on. Many hash functions exist, but today I'll be using the PCG hash. The PCG hash is an unsigned integer hash, meaning it takes only unsigned integers as inputs and returns a new random unsigned integer, which we can put into the range of 0 to 1 by dividing it by the maximum possible 32-bit integer value. How it works? doesn't really matter. Like I said, it just shuffles the input around a bunch to produce a seemingly random number. We can create some white noise by generating a texture and using the coordinates of each pixel as the input of the hash and storing the output in the corresponding texel. As you can see, the hash looks sufficiently random, which is the first step in creating Perlin noise. Before we make Perlin noise though, let's learn about and implement Perlin noise's simpler sibling, value noise. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video has been sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. With topics covering basic algebra to calculus and beyond, Brilliant's comprehensive range of math courses are built for learners of any level, whether you want to brush up on fundamentals or challenge yourself with advanced concepts. I personally use Brilliant whenever I need a quick refresher on math concepts that I haven't worked with in a while, and I think it's a great starting point for someone looking to improve their math skills for game development as it involves lots of linear algebra. Since shader programs programming is also essentially just math, a lot of the lessons can be directly applied to shader authoring to create novel effects such as fractal rendering. Be sure to try out everything Brilliant has to offer with a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual plan when you visit brilliant.org forward slash acerola or click the link in the description. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Returning to our mountain example, if we were to sample the height of the terrain multiple times in similar locations in space, they will all have pretty similar values, unlike white noise which would have completely random values for each sample. To mimic this with our own noise function, we will define it in terms of some position in space. Points that are close together in space should have similar results. Let's start by analyzing the one-dimensional case. Remember that our hash function works on integer values only, so we create a number line and hash each whole number. Positions in space that line up with the whole numbers will return the corresponding 
hash, but what about the points in between, such as an input of 1.5? We want a blend between the two neighboring random numbers. To do this, we will take the floor and ceiling of our input to get the neighboring whole number hashes. With the fractional part of our position, we take the first hash and add the fraction times the difference of the second and first hashes. In this example, our fraction is 0.5, and the result will be equivalent to the average of the two numbers, or the midpoint between them. This formula is known as linear interpolation, and I will be referring to it as lerp from now on. By lerping between the whole number hashes, we have satisfied our needs. Samples of the noise that are close together in space have similar results. This is called value noise, and it looks like shit. Thankfully, we can make a few improvements. Okay, I lied. There's really only one improvement we can make. The fractional part of the lerp is what controls the blend. Right now, it's a linear value from 0 to 1, which is why our linear interpolation is, well, linear. If we apply some function to the term, we can make our interpolation non-linear, giving smoother results and a more pleasant blend. These are often called easing functions, and the most popular one is called the smooth step, which is a third-order interpolant. It's so popular, shader languages offer it as a built-in function. Applying the smooth step to the interpolation term will make our value noise look more like a wave and less like a jagged mess. This finishes our value noise implementation, but one-dimensional noise isn't very useful. We we need at least two dimensions to create textures. Our noise function will now take an x and y value as input, and we expand our number line into a two-dimensional lattice. Just like we assigned random numbers to each integer on the number line, each point on our lattice grid is hashed. Now we just need to blend between these lattice corners. For ease of demonstration, let's zoom into one square of our lattice. Given our input position, we once again take the floor and ceiling of the components to get the coordinates of the corners and hash the positions to get the random numbers. In order to get the blended result, we first lerp between the bottom two corners on the x-axis, then lerp between the top two corners on the x-axis, and then finally lerp between those two values on the y-axis, using the fractional part of our input position, same as before. This process is known as bilinear interpolation, and it's what your GPU does behind the scenes every time you sample a texture with bilinear filtering enabled. If we expand this process out to the whole lattice grid, we can now visualize our value noise. As you can see, it's a much smoother source of RNG than white noise. Also, here's the comparison between the raw lerp and the smooth step. As usual, base lerp looks terrible. Despite its simplicity, value noise is still widely used today because it's usually good enough. For instance, Inigo Quiles used value noise to create this landscape for one of his shader toy demos, which looks pretty good. Now that we understand value noise, we can finally move on to Perlin noise. I mentioned earlier that Perlin noise and value noise are siblings. That's because they're both based on the lattice structure we've become familiar with. This means that they both construct their output in the same way, with the bilinear interpolation of four different values. Where they differ though is how the values to be blended blended are obtained. While value noise and Perlin noise are both lattice-based, Perlin noise belongs to a different subcategory known as gradient noise, so I guess they're more like cousins, but I don't feel like rewriting the earlier parts of my script after realizing this. A gradient is a vector that points in the direction of greatest change from a given position. Think of it like the direction a function is moving in at a given point in space. Our Perlin noise implementation begins with assigning a random gradient vector to each point on our lattice grid. This is a two-component vector with each component ranging from negative one to one. Given a position on our lattice, for each corner of the square it falls within, we take the dot product of the gradient vector at that corner and the vector pointing towards the input position from the corner. Then the process is the same as value noise. We bilinearly interpolate between the four dot products and we have Perlin noise. Unlike value noise, Perlin noise has a pleasant flow to it as a result of the gradient vector approach, giving it a more organic appearance. It sort of looks like slime mold. This is the original Perlin noise algorithm invented by Ken Perlin back in 1983, but since then he's made a few improvements. 
So let's go over the improved Perlin noise algorithm. Original Perlin noise has a couple mathematical oversights that lead to some undesirable behavior. The first issue is with how we generate our random gradient vectors. If we naively generate random numbers between negative one and one for the x and y components, we are creating a random unit cube gradient vector. This leads to a non-uniform distribution of gradient vectors, as when a cube is mapped onto a sphere, the directions become bunched up up around the poles. The bunching of gradient vectors causes the Perlin noise to have more directional artifacts as it's more likely for gradients to point in similar directions. To fix this, we want our gradient vectors to be uniformly distributed on a sphere rather than a cube. There's a number of ways to do this, but the math is pretty uninteresting, so here's one method. With uniformly distributed gradients, there are less directional artifacts in the Perlin noise, but they're still present as it's entirely possible for random directions to coincidentally repeatedly point in similar directions, even if they're uniformly distributed. Ken Perlin tried to fix this by having a set of predefined gradients that are randomly picked from instead of randomly generating gradients themselves, but the problem still persists here as it's entirely possible to randomly pick the same gradient multiple times. So. I'm not really sure what he was cooking with that. Unfortunately, directional artifacts are an ever-present issue with Perlin noise, but we've mitigated them to the best of our ability. The second oversight of original Perlin noise is with our interpolant. When we want to do lighting calculations on an object, we need two vectors, the direction of the light source and the vector orthogonal to the surface at the point being evaluated, also known as the normal vector. In order to get a normal vector, we need to know the change in the x-axis and the change in the z-axis from which we construct a tangent and bitangent, and then take the cross product to obtain the normal. If you've been paying attention, then you'd know that the gradient vector informs us of these directional changes, but in this case, we are talking about the gradient of the noise itself, not the gradients used to compute the Perlin noise. Not confusing at all. We could approximate a gradient vector by doing multiple samples of the noise in each direction, and then calculating the difference between them, also known as calculating normals by central difference. But, since our noise is an actual math function, we can calculate these derivatives the old-fashioned way by taking partial derivatives with respect to each axis and obtaining the gradient that way, avoiding the expensive central difference calculation and also getting perfectly accurate normal vectors, a total win-win. Unfortunately, while this does work, our smooth-step interpolant ruins everything by introducing discontinuities in the gradient as demonstrated here by Inigo Quiles. Why does it cause these discontinuities though? The math is accurate, these are the proper normal vectors, there's no bug. If we replace our smooth step with its actual math expression, we can take the first derivative. Remember that a derivative of a function represents the change of the function at a given point, so if we take the derivative of the derivative, we can see how the derivative itself is changing. This reveals the problem. The second derivative is discontinuous at points 0 and 1, which our interpolant is evaluated at. The change of the gradient at one border of a lattice cell does not match up with the change of the gradient on the opposite side of the border, causing the discontinuity. To fix this, we must use a different interpolant. Ken Perlin shows a fifth order interpolant because it fits the requirements of a continuous second order derivative. While this mildly changes the appearance of the Perlin noise, it solves the gradient discontinuity. With uniformly distributed gradient vectors and a better interpolant, we have finished the improved Perlin noise algorithm as explained by Ken Perlin in GPU Gems Chapter 5 from 2004. From here, we could move on to implementing simplex noise, which solves Perlin noise's directional artifact issues entirely but that's a topic for another day. In future videos, we'll be using Perlin noise for all sorts of things, such as terrain generation. How exciting. Also, do I really think Perlin noise is the most influential graphics algorithm? No, it's probably Blin Fong or ray tracing, but Perlin noise is definitely up there. If you would like to support the channel and help me continue producing graphics programming resources, please check out the Patreon. As usual, a huge thank you to all my current patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to go see Mickey17 five days in a row. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.